Thank you very much, Pam. Um, when, when I was talking with Pam about doing a slideshow for this event, I have quite a number of wildflowers and uh, petroglyphs and the Cherokee path and Indians and all kinds of stuff. This is a great choice for this time of year because as she said, it's a sampler. It's a random, not random, a care, care, carefully thought out, very carefully thought out selection of photographs I have taken over 30 years. And, and I told, I met two folks in Burger King a while ago and I told both of them, I said, the one thing I can guarantee you is you, you're going to see things tonight that you would, number one, have never seen before and probably would never have an opportunity to see otherwise. They just, I happen to be there at the right time. For example, have you ever seen a fledgling buzzard before? Have you ever seen buzzard eggs? Well, you're going to see them right here in a little bit. Have you ever spent any time analyzing bear scat? Jane says, I, this is my lovely wife, Jane Chastain over here. Jane spent 34 years teaching kindergarten, and she's a very dedicated teacher, National Board Certified Teacher, and so her life was teaching kindergarten. And as she re approached retirement age, and I know she doesn't look like it, but uh, she's been retired now, what, five years? Six years, time flies. And people started getting worried about Jane. She says, you know, kindergarten teaching is her life. What's she gonna do afterwards? And so finally somebody asked her, Jane, what are you gonna do? And she said, well, I think I'm just gonna follow Dennis around. He seems to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. This is titled Joe Cassie Gorgeous because we live over in the, in the Joe Cassie Gorgeous area. But everything you're gonna see here tonight applies to this area also. Um, it is broken up into categories, and we cannot possibly cover all of it tonight. With your permission, I'm going to slip over, skip over petroglyphs, which is an absolutely fascinating topic, and it's hot right now. Uh, an archaeologist and myself uh, discovered it's now, well, it was in the year 2000, about a thousand Indian rock art. Uh, rock carvings up on Table Rock and Pinnacle Mountains, which is kind of the epicenter of the Joe Cassie Gorgeous region. In the years after that, we became fast friends and started checking every rock out cropping in the area. To make a very long story short, uh, me and another fellow raised enough funds to hire an archaeologist about six weeks ago to come up here and spend a week studying this site, the main of now 15 sites. It is just incredible. He sent me an email this morning, he lives in, uh, in Atlanta, that he got some fellows with a drone to take an overview of just one rock outcropping now. It has over a thousand, a thousand and fifty-three petroglyphs. So we don't know what they mean, but it meant a lot to somebody one time. I will, I will let you look at them, but we're not going to spend a lot of time into petroglyphs. It's, it's kind of another slideshow altogether. Let's get on to black bears and snakes and dragonflies and wildflowers and things like that. This is a, I, I do want to stop with this slide for a minute because it really is what we're about tonight. And, and that is the blue wall or the Blue Ridge front or some people call it the Blue Ridge escarpment. Uh, it, it, it starts, if you go back down to Highway 11, turn west and um, head toward Table Rock State Park, Somewhere around Gowansville, you will start to see a wall of mountains on the right side, on, in, to the due north. That's the Blue Ridge Escarpment. It is an incredible phenomenon, honestly, because it has such dramatic relief. It is a wall of mountains, and it's a result of, of 400 million years ago when the two plates, the African plate and the North, North American plate, collided. And this is the front. This is where the collision took place. And virtually all of our major ridges slope northeast to southwest. Uh, the southern exposure always has very different vegetation from the north, which is mostly laurel and ivy, is what I grew up calling it, rhododendron maximum and, and uh, calmia latifolia, which you probably call mountain laurel and, and great laurel or Rotor, uh, maximum rotor, big rotor dinner. Anyway, this is the blue wall. That's Table Rock and Pinnacle where the petroglyphs are. I'm gonna have to get used to this. Where's the uh, laser? Um, 
red line right on top. It's red with buttons. That one. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, this is where the petroglyphs are, right up in here. Uh, but anyway, this is the blue, the blue wall, the Blue Ridge Escarpment. This is the area that National Geographic a couple years ago deemed to be one of the 50 last great places to visit on Earth, and for good reason. Just one more thing about this area, one of the things that makes it so unique. Just from a botanical perspective, one of the reasons we have such diver diverse and abundant flora is because we're actually at the southern limit for a lot of northern species, species that you would find in the northern, uh, northeastern United States and even in, into Canada. We are also at the northern limit of a lot of tropical and subtropical species too, so they kind of collide right here. You will find things uh, right where I live in Pickens County up on these high elevation uh, granitic dome plant communities that you find among the dunes at Myrtle Beach. And, and farther south. So because of that, we have a tremendous, I tell people I'm on first name basis with about 1,200 plants. And, and the reason I say that about the first name basis, they're plants I encounter almost every day. 1,200 species. So we're, we're very fortunate uh, here in this area. That's a pretty dramatic view of a helicopter view taken of Table Rock. I and mean, this is what we're going to not talk about. <laughs> oh, I got to tell you about this photograph. Um, I'm a hunter and, and have been for most of my life. And I hunt, you remember I pointed out Pinnacle Mountain, which is actually the second tallest mountain in the state. We live right at the base of that mountain on Highway 11. And I walk to where I hunt, and so it takes me about two and a half hours to get up on Pinnacle to one of my special hunting places up there. The morning of January the 1st, the year 2000, which is the last day of our deer season, I decided I wanted to go up to my place that I call Pretty Place, and I wanted to get up there before first light. Got there while it was still dark down on the ground, but I could see it was breaking light. Turned around, and the sun was rising on a new millennium. So this is the literal rise of a new millennium. These, uh, these are just a, a handful of the petroglyphs that are on that particular site. This kind of goes with the petroglyphs and pictographs. By the way, this is, uh, this is where dirt daubers used to make their nests before we had soffits and eaves on our houses and <laughs> old barns and things like that. Uh, it's inside of a rock shelter and also this is where Phoebe used to make her nest. You, know, you probably have a Phoebe around here. They love window sills and ledges and, and things like that and uh, this is where they did it before we came along. Okay, <clears throat> buzzard eggs. Many years ago, I was out botanizing on a mountain called Big Rock in our area. Big granitic dome, kind of a Monadnock, Monadnock which is a, an isolated mountain and not necessarily connected with any other chain. Big dome uh, of mountains, and it's pretty steep. And I had climbed up there, spent a morning botanizing up around the, the plant communities that are associated with the rock cliffs. And I went off the backside to go back, which, as I said, is almost always steeper uh, than the south side. So I'm sliding off down through there, and I passed a rock shelter. And I can't, I can't miss a rock shelter. There, there are always interesting things in there, animal tracks and scats, and sometimes Indian artifacts. So I said, well, I've got my camera with me. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go crawl in this rock shelter. The entrance was only about this wide, but it was about four feet, five feet wide and it's, it's big enough for humans to have gotten back in there, Native Americans, and gotten out of a shelter. So as I approach the thing, I'm about four feet away, and this buzzard comes flying out there. They've got like a four foot wingspan. It's like a 747 right over my head. And I said, good Lord. And I looked and the buzzard flew up there. 
And I said, why would that buzzard be under that rock shelf? It was wildflower season, spring of the year. I said, I bet you there's a nest in there. I've never seen buzzard eggs. So here we go. I couldn't crawl in there with my day pack, so I had to get my day pack off. I crawl in there, and the stench was so bad. But I had a little flashlight, and I could see, and yeah, there was, there was some buzzard eggs. So I go back out, I get my camera. And I took one big breath, and I went, shutting in there. They backed out. So that may be your only opportunity, certainly your best opportunity, to see buzzard eggs. Uh, and they're not much, they're not much to see, but uh, uh, if you've ever seen duck eggs, they're about the size of duck eggs. Half again as big as a large chicken egg. Okay, so there's that. <laughs> Several years ago, Several years after that, on another mountain a few miles away, oddly enough named Buzzard Roost Mountain, I was out exploring, gouging around, and uh, again, steep cliffs on the, actually steep and rocky cliffs, nearly vertical on the north side of, of Buzzard Mountain, kind of working my way along one line looking in various rock shelters. I was pretty heavy into looking for pictographs, cave paintings, and they're generally in rock shelters. And so as I was approaching this rock shelter, there, there was just this opening right here, you know, just what you see there. And, uh, and, and as I walked past it, something white went flashing by there. And I was only three or four feet away, but I couldn't tell what it was. Backed up and waited, and this showed up. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This is the fledgling buzzard. This is the face that only a mother buzzard could love. <laughs> That has to be one of God's ugliest productions yet. <laughs> and there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> but that's, that's a fledgling buzzard. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of baby wildlife, I told you about the archaeologist, Tommy Charles, that he and I, uh, I had a, I had a phone call from him just out of the cold, really, but it happens a lot when you write for a wildlife magazine. Folks call wanting to know how to get a possum out of their basement and, and how to get skunks in off of their cocker spaniel and things like that. <laughs> and uh, so this guy calls and says he's an archaeologist with the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology in Columbia, and he's looking for petroglyphs. And, and I'm thinking, what kind of archaeologist is this? The petroglyphs are out in New Mexico and Arizona and the American Southwest. We have arrowheads and pottery. We don't have any petroglyphs. And I listened for a little bit and I said, well, let me ask you something. Um, how many of these petroglyphs have you seen in South Carolina? He said, six. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, right, his office is in Columbia. He said, right here off of Assembly Street in Columbia, between there and the Congaree River, there is a boulder with a meticulously carved beetle on it. And I've seen it. It is meticulously carved, and it's large. It's not some little tiny thing. And so now he's got my interest. And uh, tells me about one. He's seen a turtle on a rock on the Chattooga River on the South Carolina-Georgia border. And, and so I said, well, what, how can I help you? He said, well, they tell me you know your way around up in the mountains. And he said, they're finding these in northwestern uh, Georgia, eastern Tennessee, Virginia, western North Carolina. They ought to be in South Carolina. He said, do you know of any granitic domes or outcroppings? And I said, well, I live next to the biggest granitic dome in South Carolina, Table Rock. You come up to the house, and if, you, if, if there's anything up there, we'll find it. Now, this is going to sound like something I made up, but it's gospel truth. We found 600 that first day, wow. all on one rock outcropping. And it has a continuing story that goes with it, but that's for when we do petroglyphs sometime. Several years later, we kind of focused on pictographs. There were only three known pictographs, cave paintings, uh, in South Carolina. We have found three more since then. One of them was in this rock shelter, which we now call the Bear Shelter. And uh, it's, a, it's a funny story how we came to find out about it. We had a friend, a common friend, who was kind of a benefactor of this rock art survey that we were doing, financing it. And her 16-year-old son, 15-year-old son, was a Boy Scout. And they were going between on the hiking trail between Sassafras Mountain and Table Rock Mountain. And he calls his mom. 
And he says, Mom, I have found a huge rock shelter. He said, this thing is like an auditorium. Well, now, first of all, this is in my backyard. I don't know about this thing. So Leslie calls me and she says, John is up on Pinnacle Mountain and he has sent me cell phone. You know how kids are. I, I, it took me a while to think of a phone being also a camera. I'm still trying to get over that. I'm still trying to get over the fact that my cell phone camera is better than my camera camera. I have actually had art of photographs from my cell phone published in the Wildlife Magazine. So she sends me on the computer while we're talking on the phone a photo, and this thing is massive. It's like 100 feet across the front, 40 feet deep. The ceiling is 20 feet tall. And I said, John, I've never, I have no idea this is in my backyard. This is where I've spent most of my adult life. Where are you? Well, this is where it gets interesting. This is a 15-year-old speaking to a 63-year-old. <laughs> and he says, well, it's like, um, you know, between Sassafras and Pinnacle. I said, yeah, your mother told me that. I said, describe what it looks like around where you are. He's up at 3,000 feet. He says, well, it's like um, we just crossed like a river. And I said, John, there are no rivers at 3,000 feet. It's a, it's a creek, right? And he says, I said, could you step across it in one step? He says, um, yeah, yeah, that's it. So I said, there's only one place the creek crosses Foothills Trail up there. I know right where you are. So I called Tommy in Columbia. And I said, Tommy, we've we got to get up there and check this thing out. This is clear. I mean, you could put an army in this place. Long story short, he comes up a few days later. We make our way up there. It takes two and a half hours to get there. And as we're approaching it, there's this screaming sound. I mean, screeching, screaming sound coming out of rock shelter. Well, Tommy's attitude on, on things like that is, I'm just here for the archaeology. Anything else that happens, it's, it's Dennis. He'll take care of it. And, uh, and so he says, well, what do you think we ought to do? And I said, well, Tommy, I have heard foxes. I've heard cougars. I've heard coyotes. I don't know what this is. I said, let's just talk and make noise as we approach it, it's big enough that whatever it is, we'll have plenty of opportunity to get out of there. And sure enough, as we approached it, it quietened down. So we kind of had to uh, develop a routine at that point. Tommy has some software that he could photograph the walls and the ceilings of a rock shelter. And even if it is faded to the point where you and I can't see it, it's faded outside the visible range, this software will pick out any regularities in tint and color and, and put the image up there. So Tommy just starts photographing things and I get down on my hands and knees and start looking for arrowheads and other things. So I get down on my hands and knees and I work my way down to the lower end of this rock shelter. Tommy's still up on the upper end and it's really treacherous in there because over the millennia, as you can see, flakes have fallen off. And I'm talking about a flake being the size of an automobile. And it's a jumbled up mess, treacherous to walk and, and run on. And so I'm on my hands and knees and there is a patch of dirt. And I see these little pad, little footprints with a little pad and some toes. And I'm thinking cougar. I said, Tommy, I think this might be a cougar that was making all that screaming sound. And I wrote an article once about cougars. There are cougars in the mountains of North and South Carolina, all up and down the Appalachians. So Tommy, Tommy he, he doesn't hear very well, and there's a waterfall that falls over the roof of this thing. And he's up there, it turns out, um, he, I don't know that he ever understood what I was telling him. I said, Tommy, I think there's a cougar in here that was making all this, this racket. Come down here and photograph these tracks. Well, he's up there fooling with his camera. And about the time I hollered that out to Tony, two bear cubs, two tiny little bear cubs come wailing, screaming their lungs out, come crawling out of a cavity right below where I am. And I said, Tommy, get down here and, and photograph these little bear cubs. Mama can't be far away. And we need to get the heck out of here. And, and so he's up there and his, his memory streak has run out and he's doing this. Well, when I hollered, the two cubs went back in the cavity, and all of a sudden I could hear the, the squealing coming out. There's a back door entrance to this thing, a little shuttle, shuttle hole in the back. So I devised a plan. <laughs> I said, well, when Tommy does finally get down here, we'll probably have one opportunity to photograph these cubs. How often does that happen? And, and so I took my walking stick, and I said, I'm going to field test this theory before Tommy gets down here to make sure it works. I stuck my walking stick down in there and stirred it around. 
And the cubs come running out, come right to my feet, squalling their lungs out, and mama comes blasting out of there. About 350 pounds. I can literally see the hair standing up on her back. She wheels around and squares up with me, and the two cubs are standing at my feet, six feet away, and there I was. <laughs> what do you do? It doesn't get any worse than that. And I said, well, Tommy, are you coming down here to photograph this? Well, he's up there giving it to us, and he, don't, he, he doesn't know any of this is going on. And there we were, and I was in a standoff, and I have had lots and lots and lots of bear encounters, some in the daytime and some in the dark, and some that I didn't know how it was going to go, how it was going to end up. And what I have learned about black bears is you have to stand your ground. They're easily intimidated if you stand your ground appear to be larger than you are yourself. This is not grizzlies. Now, if you do what I'm about to tell you with grizzlies, you end up in a grizzly's stomach. They see us as food. Um, black bears are much more easily intimidated. So I just locked onto her and you know had a grimacing look and I had my walking stick and I kind of hunched up to appear larger. And she looks over the situation and the, and the cubs are just still down there squalling their lungs out. They're clearly not going with her. They have apparently decided I'm the solution to all their problems, <laughs> whatever it is. So she, uh, not literally, but she blinked. She turned and, and walked about five feet and then wheeled around again, I think thinking maybe the cubs would follow her. She did it two more times and then she left. I said, Tommy, did you get all this over? And he's up there still to, <laughs> unaware of the whole thing. He finally makes it down there and gets this one cub. Isn't that a precious photograph? I would say that cub weighs, they're twins, probably weighed about, uh, about four or five pounds. <laughs> but anyway, that's my computer desktop image now from time to time. So, huh? She eventually slipped out the far end, and I'm sure she didn't go very far. But when Tommy did finally make us down there, took that photo, I said, Tommy, we need to get out of here now because she's going to come in the back end, and then there will be. Because like I say, it's treacherous. You can't really run in there, and, and you don't ever want to do that with a black bear. Throw rocks at them, rattle a sapling branch, holler at them, call them ugly names, all sorts of things to intimidate them, and they'll, they'll leave. Mm. These, these are pictographs that I was talking about, cave paintings. By the way, that is Tony Charles Wright there. I hate we can't do everything, but uh, okay, black bears. Everybody's interested in black bears, and I'm, I, like I say, I've been dealing with black bears uh, for 20, 25 years, and I'm still learning. Uh, bl black bears are a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Uh, at the same time, they are an elusive creature that will shy away from the slightest hint of human scent and that same black bear might show up on your deck pulling the uh, bird feeder down and <laughs> having it. Uh, they're, they're kind of an odd species. They have clearly uh, decided that their future lies in learning to live among us, and I think that's good advice for us. You know, if, if you have a nuisance bear, you need to understand that this is where he lives too. Uh, just find ways to live with him. Take up all your cat food, dog food, garbage cans, and stuff like that for a short period of time, and he'll leave. He's only there for the food. Take away the food, he's gone. He's got other things to do. And particularly in the fall of the year, it's all about calories. Uh, black bears actually do hibernate in this area. They go into a winter torpor. It's probably not as deep as, say, Minnesota, you know, in terms of lowered metabolic rate and respirations, that kind of thing. Uh, and they do periodically, particularly the males, wake up a couple times during the winter and walk around. I've seen quite large bear tracks in the snow in February in March, but for about three months they're dormant. And so they have got, and the cubs are born during hibernation, so they've got to put on these calories. Black bears have been recorded consuming 20,000 calories a day. 
20,000 calories a day during that feeding frenzy between about the 1st of October and mid-November when the white oak acorns are just falling in mass. You know, this is where you can hear them on your roof and sometimes you can't safely walk in the woods or so many acorns and sometimes there's almost nothing, which results in... Bears will go wherever the food is. 15 miles, 30 miles in the daytime is nothing for them. Uh, this is a photo I shot. It's kind of blurry because I was out actually on a scouting trip and I was on that same mountain where the buzzard fledgling was, but I was up on the top. I was just standing up there and leaning up against the tree. And I see this bear coming up the ridge. He's walking right straight toward me because I'm in a gap. It's pretty clear he's going to cross the gap. I said, this will be interesting. I'm just going to see just how close this bear will get to me. And so I just lean up there and he comes and he gets about close to me right here. And I said, hey. <laughs> and he jumps on oh, and turns and, and I'll just saw a black flash, that's all. So most of the times that's the way black bear encounters go. There are some older males that have an attitude and you just have to kind of look at the overall situation, but always, always try to make yourself appear bigger, intimidating, and even the, the boldest will eventually leave you. Um, Sometimes you may notice uh, a, a tag in a bear's ear if it's ever been trapped for whatever reason as a part of a study or because it's a deuce the bear. They'll weigh them, take some blood, and uh, look for parasites, and then they put a tag and a number in there that can help them keep up with the wear, uh, how much they travel, which can be impressive. They trapped a bear in my area there one time. It had been hanging out at a used car lot in Westminster over in Oconee County. And it was a grand thing. It made the newspaper and everybody thought it was great. There'd be lawn chairs out there and people waiting on the bear to show up. And, <laughs> and the guy sold a lot of cars and then he finally got tired of it. The public got tired of it. He calls the wildlife department and says, come get your bear. And so they go over there and they collect the bear. This is in Westminster over in uh, Oconee County. They took the bear 70 miles away into eastern Tennessee. Within 14 days, it was back. A little more mature bear. Uh, he's got two ear tags in him. So uh, I think he probably has a history with, uh, you know, with, with dog food and bird food. And, uh oh. Cubs. I have seen uh, twins are actually quite common among black bears. Uh, and, and I have seen triplets. And sows will keep the females of the previous year, in other words, the yearling females with them. I have seen black bears with five what appear to be cubs, but they're actually one-year-old females. The, the males, they run off that first year. Uh, Af uh, black bears are unique in terms of reproduction in, in several respects. Really intriguing. Bears have something, I'm really not aware of any other mammalian species that does this, maybe bats. It's called delayed implantation. They breed in June, but development does not start until the fall of the year. And like I say, gestation is, is during the winter. And it, I, I sometimes think about this, they're usually born in March or April. I'm, I'm usually born during the winter and then the, they all emerge in the spring. And so the sow goes in, she crawls in this nice little nest in the fall of the year, crawls in there. And when she wakes up in the spring, there's this little four pound bundle of joy and she has no idea where it came from. Because when they're born, they're hairless, blind, they attach to a teat and, and suck, you know, until they you know, grow very rapidly. That one you saw could not have been out of the den more than, I believe that was late March or, or uh, early April. So they had just emerged. Probably that was their winter den uh, where they were. So. Uh, but delayed in implantation is they breed in June. They do not implant on the uterus and start developing as an embryo until October, June to October. And I believe the reason for that, sometimes you don't want to overthink a situation because nature has her own rules and sometimes it's hard to know what those rules are, but it appears to me, because I have a master's degree in nutrition and understand a little bit about this, um, it's probably that delayed implantation is by October when the acorns are falling, 
the bear's metabolism reflects either an abundant supply of food, a scarcity of food, or something in between. So do you implant one or do you implant two or even three? In a bumper year, the bear would probably have three uh, you know, fertilized eggs implant and three embryo embryos would develop in the cubs. That's just the logic that I have kind of imposed on it, but it makes sense in terms of everything I know. The other phenomenon, which uh, I think it was Thoreau who said nature is red in tooth and claw. Uh, sometimes Jane thinks, for example, that every snake is a bad snake and ought to be killed on sight, <laughs> no matter what kind it is or anything. But you know, everything has its place in nature. And, and black bears have in common with Japanese macaques and African lions that they go on the prowl in the spring of the year and they kill all the cubs they encounter. And, and here's the logic that I didn't come up with, but bear biologists all across the country have, have come to this conclusion that what this is about is protecting your territory. Bears, uh, black bear, male black bears uh, patrol and maintain and consider their own a pretty large territory, about twice that of females, about 15 square kilometers, pretty large area. He has no idea whether that's his progeny or not, but it's utilizing his resources. And so if he does not kill the bear and it's a female, the female mother bear will not come into estrus for two years and she'll keep that cub with her so he doesn't get to breed her even though she's living in his territory and, and, and her progeny are utilizing his resource and if it's a male it will eventually become competition. If he kills the cubs, she will become estrus immediately and he just follows her around and breeds her and then he knows the progeny of that union is his. That's the logic. African lions do it, Japanese macaques do it. It's kind of brutal, but we've had some cases of it where uh, they did a radio telemetry study up in the Jocassi Gorges and I helped them uh, find their way around how to get from here to here to there and kept up with what they were going on. They called me one morning and said they had a particular female bear with two cubs that they could not find. The signal had not moved in two days and they couldn't figure out how to access the site. It was off the north side of a mountain. So I told them how to get in there and they went in there and they found the mother bear and one cub, the, the sow was dead, and uh, the, the other cub was just, just missing. And the mother, the mother bear uh, had, had been partially eaten. So they took the young bear, the cub, which was injured, but in, in not in all that bad shape, sent it to a rehabilitation clinic in Virginia. They kept it for almost a year. Came back as a healthy 140 year old, uh, 140, pound yearling bear, uh, so it's just the reality of how nature works sometimes. This bad boy, uh, it wasn't so much us, we live uh, right at Table Rock State Park. This is about a 350 pound bear. You know I told you some male bears just have an attitude. Uh, my 90 year old aunt lives next mailbox down and she has, and, and my cousin lived behind us who had a five year old and a seven year old at that time. And this, this male was going right up on their decks and intimidating my aunt as she walked from the house to the garage, had killed and eaten her little dog, uh, which is a crime beyond comprehension. It was, had been her constant companion for years. So I called the wildlife department and I said, I know your policy is not to, to relocate bear, trap and relocate bears unless human life or property is in danger or something like that. I said, we need to get rid of this bear. He's, he, once bears start doing that, making a living off of dog food and cat food, whether it's garbage dumps or whatever, you can't break them from it. Um, so we trapped this bear, which is pretty impressive. Um, that's his pad. And I just used that bullet for a comparison, but they have tremendous canine teeth and uh, went with them as they released him. Uh, that's him heading off into the Joe Cassie Gorges. Fortunately, he never came back. Um, this, most people don't know, but this is a telephone pole or a power pole. Uh, black bears love to make males make marking posts, just like deer rub up a tree, you know, with their antlers to say, I'm the biggest deer in this area. And uh, bears, they, they don't do it like you might think. They back up to, a, to actually a pine tree is more common, and they scratch from this way, claw this way. I have seen huge trees 
that they have done this year after year in the same spot. They've gotten down to the heart of the tree. And, and they do it to power poles because they love the smell of creosote. Uh, you know, it's outlawed by EPA and you can't buy it anymore, but if there are any of those old creosote telephone poles out there, they will get, take them down. Blue Ridge Electric Co-op is the electric cooperative in our area. They actually have a line item in their budget to replace almost annually power poles anywhere north of Highway 11 because the bears are going to claw them over the years to the point where you could take your hand and break that one. So start looking around there everywhere once you know what to look for. Uh, there again, they've just clawed it. And, and sometimes because what happens when you claw up or injure a pine tree? Bleeds like a stuck pig, you know, as pine rosin starts dripping out of there. And that's part of the reason, I think, is because that, that scent spreads far and wide. And the sow can go up there. Almost always you will find black bear hair embedded in that. It's kind of like amber. Once it solidifies, the bear hair is in it. And she can go and smell that hair and say, oh, that's so-and-so. I didn't know he lived over here. <laughs> so when she needs his services, she knows where to find him. Uh, sometimes they'll do it on smaller saplings, I think just, you know, for effect. <laughs> uh, this is where they uh, just literally bit a popper sapling into, and I, apparently I was right behind the bear when this happened. Uh, here's the more typical pine tree. You can see that numerous um, claw marks in all directions. This is the old one. This one had not been hit that year when I photographed it, but this one had. You can see the fresh rosin right in here, claw marks. And you notice how the claw marks are going side to side. Like I say, he's reaching over his shoulder. And I've actually sat and watched him do this. Uh, and, and in many cases, if the bear lives a long time, they will go back to those same trees every year and uh, whittle it down. Bear scat. Uh, as a bear hunter, being able to age bear scat to tell whether it was yesterday or last week or two months ago is an important thing. And, and so Jane says, I have a PhD in scatology. <laughs> I have developed a method uh, of aging bear scat, and, and it's pretty simple actually when you understand this one principle. Uh, bears eat primarily acorns, particularly October through about January when they're either gone or so deeply buried in the leaves or sprouted or have worms in them or whatever, they'll move on to something else, which is also about the time they crawl in a hole somewhere. But acorns of all kinds, you know, there are two categories of oaks. There are the white oak family and the red oak family. Red oaks have much, much, orders of magnitude, more of a chemical which is bitter tasting called tannins Tannins is the thing that turns your mouth inside out when you eat a green persimmon. That's one of those things you don't have to do but one time in your whole lifetime. <laughs> Once is enough, thank you. And, and the reason tannins are important to detect in the diet is they limit the bioavailability of certain nutrients. So it's giving that animal and us an indication of whether we ought to be eating that food or not. If you eat a food with a lot of tannins in it, you're going to get less nutritional reward from that because it just physically precipitates many of the mineral elements, trace elements, for example, but also some of the vitamins. It's not going to be as nutritious. So if it tastes sweet and has very little tannin in it, that's the one you want. The white oak class, as a class of trees, has the lowest levels of tannin. And probably in South Carolina, white oak and live oak down on the coast have the lowest even among the white oak class. So much so that Native Americans used them. Uh, would grind them up into a gruel, dry them, uh, roast them, dry them, grind them up into a gruel and make a pretty palatable bread according to those who ate it in the 18th century. Uh, pretty good. Deer stew and uh, acorn, water oak, acorn bread was thought to be a pretty good thing. Now, here's the one thing you notice how this one is kind of blackish or certainly dark gray. Tannins oxidize almost immediately on exposure to oxygen. So what I have found by doing a cross section with my little foot, see that one's actually starting to turn black. This one, bear's been eating hickory nuts. If you've never seen or heard a black bear eat hickory nuts, number one, 
hickory nuts are extremely hard. Uh, and, and I wanted to prove this to Jane one time. And I put a hickory nut on a brick and hit it with a hammer and it broke the brick. It didn't break the hickory nut, but it broke the brick. I have sat and watched black bears, you know the expression like a, uh, like a mule eating briars? And they were grinning like that. I have sat and watched them pop hickory nuts like they were peanuts. Now it probably takes about 500 foot pounds of pressure to break a hickory nut and they eat them routinely, but they show up in the scat as it looks something like a Nutty Buddy. You remember the Nutty Buddy ice cream there, you know? Yeah. So th this one's pretty dried out. And this is what it looks like fresh out of the bear. As a matter of fact, if it's any fresher than this, it's still in the bear. I'll tell you the story about this one real quick, then I'll finish up the tannin story about how quickly it oxidizes. Uh, when, when I encountered this bear scat, it was bear season. And, and, and I'm up there doing the hunter thing, you know, and I'm looking for sign. And I'm in an area that, that, that I know uh, is inhabited by a lot of bears routinely year in and year out. And so I know they're in the area, and I'm really scanning. And all of a sudden, I see this scat. I said, whoa, he's probably looking at me right now, wherever he is. And so I go snake out, and I start looking around, and I hear a rustling around. And he's up in the tree right above my head. <laughs> uh, like I say, if it's any fresher than that, it'd still be in the bear. <laughs> but you can see that's what it normally ought to look like, kind of a cornmeal looking mush. Uh, same thing, this one has probably been exposed to air for less than an hour. Uh, <clears throat> a little more, a little more. And if I take my boot and rake it away so that I can see kind of a cross section, I can tell how much of that has actually turned colors. It surprises you sometimes, you look at one, if you had not done that, you'd say, oh, that's an old scat, a week or so. Actually, probably four hours, six hours, something like that. So you can use the rate of oxidation of those tannins in the scat to, to age it to the point where ultimately, <clears throat> depending on how much rain we get and that kind of thing, they're going to dry to a point where it's actually kind of spongy. Uh, you could pick it up, it's kind of like a bathroom sponge or the sponge you wash a car with, and then it'll just kind of dissipate. And, and oddly enough, bear scat has no scent whatsoever. You hold it right up to you. No. Uh, this is one that I think is hilarious. I've never seen it before. But apparently this bear had gotten some muscadines and had eaten almost exclusively muscadines. So it's this beautiful purple. Uh, inside and out. Okay, a little, a little more diverse subject here. White-tailed deer, which are fascinating uh, creatures in and among themselves. This buck, well actually they're both bucks, but this is a, a, a nice mature eight point and a, and a yearling forkhorn. And you can tell, I guess you can tell, that the antlers are actually covered in velvet at this time. So this is uh, like <clears throat> between spring, which the antlers start emerging, they drop their antlers every year, but the pedicel, the main base, stays in the skull. The new antlers grow out from that. And uh, by June or so, this is probably a May-June photo, uh, they, they will have pretty much attained the size and shape that they're gonna be in the fall of the year, but they don't start rubbing the antlers off until about September in this area down on the coast, maybe a little earlier, August. Uh, but it is one of the fastest growing tissues that has yet been discovered. It's just incredibly, incredibly rich in uh, blood and nutrients, capillaries, very fast growing tissue, faster than tumors. And so they're trying to study the mechanism of that growth, trying to control it in cancer research. I could tell you a, a great deal more about whitetail deer, but uh, let's move on. We got some more, more interesting creatures. I think this is a, a signpost of a of a mature buck. Uh, as a general rule, you could tell the size of the deer and the age of the deer from the size tree he's rubbing. This is a quite large tree. This is a little bigger than it appears in the photo. It's a cedar tree, uh, eastern red cedar, probably six inches across. That, that's a that's a it's either a big mature deer or a deer that thinks too much of himself. I don't know. But he's certainly worthy of, uh, this is, happens to be a sweet birch, which emits a wonderful spearmint aroma, if you've ever smelled sweet birch. And this deer uh, found a huge, you can see antler 
antler scratchings up here beyond where he actually removed the bark, but uh, I think he thought his would have the added attraction of having that wonderful aroma. It smells like Bengay, uh, it smells just like Bengay. So he's known as the Bengay buck. <laughs> then they'll shed their antlers in January or February. And the reason you don't just find them everywhere, even though you may be an avid regular hiker, is squirrels, skunks, chipmunks, everything, calcium and magnesium and phosphorus are three of the most limited nutrients in nature. That's why a salt block will attract deer and rabbits and squirrels and everybody else. Salt in general is a limited factor. And if you're consuming basically a salt-free diet, any source of these mineral elements is, you consume it right there and right then. And so they're, they will start working on it almost as soon as it hits the ground. You can see where they've gnawed off the brow tines, the main G1 beam here, and start to work on, on the G2 and G3s. And of course now we have elk. Uh, not all this is the reintroduced, this, this one actually <coughs> just showed up in Pickens County last year and became quite famous. He was on the six o'clock news on a regular basis. Took a tour of Pickens County over about a two week period, checking it out. He's a young bull. Uh, as that herd that was introduced now over 25 years ago into Cataloochee up near Maggie Valley uh, expands outward. They kept getting closer and closer. And so we knew I worked with a, well, the chairman of our Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation in the Greenville area to get a, a bill passed long in advance of when they show up in South Carolina, making it illegal to kill an elk in South Carolina because if you don't have that law when they do show up, he's probably didn't have a very bright future. Uh, so now it's illegal to kill one and we are thinking, it's 45 minutes, okay. Gosh, time flies, <laughs> it really does. Uh, I, I, told, I told the Green News, I said, what he's doing down here is looking for his own territory. You know, he's, he got pushed out. He's in an area where there are other dominant bulls. And you probably know the story. They, they, the dominant bulls collect huge herds. And it's their herd. And they will fight you to the death for that herd, for the rights to breed that herd. And so he's uh, out checking out Pickett's County. And apparently he took a liking to it because he stayed around for about two weeks. And finally he worked his way to downtown Greenville. I think it's the Liberty Bridge down there on Main Street. It was quite an attraction and, the, and all this. And he said, you know what? I could do this. I could live here. I like this. <laughs> but he was, he was a danger to himself and, and actually to others because people just have to have a photograph. Elk had not been in South Carolina since 1773 was the last recorded elk in South Carolina. So it's quite a phenomenon and I understand that, but they had to trap him and take him back. Well, just like black bears, he knows where he's been. He knows how to get back there. Animals carry a mental map of their territories, and so I suspect he'll be back. Wild hogs, these happen to be closer to just barnyard pigs, but they've been reverted to the wild. Um, I do want to show you this one in particular. If you've ever heard this before, it's one of those rural myths that's actually true. There is a class of mule-footed hogs. In other words, they don't have a cloven hoof. They have a horse like hoof. They are thought to be the descendants of the Spanish hogs. When Hernando, Hernando de Soto came through this area in the 1540, he brought with him 300 hogs as a sort of movable feast uh, as they you know, worked through the Carolinas and eventually the Mississippi River. And if you look, sure enough, got a mule-footed hog here. There are still a few, there's a residual population down along the coast of South Carolina. So I happen to have a friend up in uh, Northern Oconee County who has kind of a menagerie of some deer and other things too. So, so I thought you ought to see one of those. This is a hog wallow. And hogs will also rub trees. They, they'll come up and with their tusk gouge up the tree and so you could confuse it for a deer except for the fact that it's covered up in mud. A hog just cannot resist a nice muddy place to wallow. Oh, scat. Let's get into the world of scat other than uh, the bear scat. Uh, this is a very recognizable if you know what it is. These are very well-defined pellets. They had been compressed as this one is like this, but you can see the individual pellets came apart and those pellets are very diagnostic. I wrote an article 
on tracks and scat in South Carolina Wildlife Magazine, and I'm pretty sure it's one of the ones they have archived. So if you go to South Carolina Wildlife Magazine archive, it's by year. They don't necessarily list my name for all the ones that, that I have written, but it doesn't matter whether I wrote it or not. They have lots and lots of their feature articles archived, clickable with the original photography that was in the article. And I remember tracks and scats are one of them. Um, and of course, that's, that's wild hog. <laughs> I have a good friend who's a researcher, a wildlife researcher over at Clemson University, and she called me one day and said they were going to do a, do a DNA study of wild hogs in the Jocassee Gorges region to try to tell where they came from. Who's trapping these hogs and where are they getting them and where are they releasing them? Because it doesn't matter how many hogs they trap out there and how many hunters kill, there's more hogs. So the more you kill, the more hogs you got. They want to find out where these hogs are coming from. She said, will you collect some scat the next time you're in the woods, put it in the freezer, and then next time I see you, I'll pick it up. And I said, okay. So the very next time I was in the woods, found some hog scat, and I put it in a little Ziploc bag. Well, it happened to be the time that Jane had made a big tray of chocolate bonbons <laughs> for some function of wedding reception or something like that and, and put them in the freezer. <laughs> and so you got a bag of hog poop and a bag of chocolate bonbons, and they were almost indistinguishable. Uh, we did get it sorted out, it all worked, it, it, it all worked out there. Uh, coyote scat, and in that article, I really encourage you to read that, because uh, most of what I wrote in there is news to most folks, because they see things, tracks and scats, and there, there's another term, spoor, S-P-O-O-R, which is a categorical term. It, it's tracks, scats, feathers, all pellets, any animal sign. <coughs> but I, I wrote a little sidebar on coyotes because there's so much confusion about coyotes and how do you tell a coyote track and stuff like that. One of the ways you can tell a coyote scat is, actually one of them is evident here, and that is they tend to deposit their, their scat in the same place time after time. Here's a very fresh one, and here's one that appears to be a week or two old. And they do that at landmark places like trail intersections, uh, conspicuous turns in the terrain and trail. The other thing is uh, animal hair. If you know, if it's got uh, if it's got deer, this actually appears to be more opossum hair. If it's got hair in it, it's probably not kibbles that a dog ate. You know. Uh, that's not that a dog won't eat roadkill or something like that, but that's just one of the clues you could look at. Uh, the other one is, if it's on a logging road, a red mud logging road, dogs tend to meander. You know, they'll go over here and work on this side, and they'll walk meander kind of off through there. Coyotes are all business. Tracks are going to be one in front of the other, right down, straight down through there. So, and of course, if the scats are located at mileposts like that, it's probably a coyote. I'm thinking, uh, if you've never seen a grouse, which is becoming extinct in South Carolina, I mean, I mean, it's an incredible phenomenon. Nobody seems to know what's going on. I have a theory that one of the places grouse, is, grouse hide from, from red-tailed hawks and other raptors is hemlock trees. You know, hemlocks have a kind of like partially open umbrella canopy, very dense, and a hawk can't fly in there and swoop you up, so that's like home base. You know, you can go hide in there. Well, as those hemlock trees become denuded from hemlock woolly indulgence, they got nowhere to escape. Uh, and then, of course, the increase in coyotes is, is certainly a factor. But I had a rare opportunity. Uh, Grouse are one of these birds that will do the wounded, wounded bird thing if you approach and she's got babies. There were little baby chicks all over in those, uh, in those wildflowers there. And, and I, when I stopped and got my camera up, and she started doing that wounded wing, wound, wounded wing thing like that. Okay, we won't do snakes here. But folks, I have enjoyed it. I hope you have and uh, learned a little something too.